Just a quick reminder before we get into the lesson to download the hands-on lab exercises that accompany this full CCNA course. I'll include the link in the description. Also, remember to subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss any of the lessons in the course. Okay, let's get into it. In this lecture, you'll learn about the common attacks that hackers use in their attempts to compromise your systems. You learned in the last lecture that if it is a targeted attack, then the hacker will typically start off with doing reconnaissance of your organization. So we'll start there. Reconnaissance obtains information about the intended victim. And in a targeted attack, as I said earlier, the attacker will typically start with completely unobtrusive methods that even normal people would be doing. It does not look like an attack at all, such as searching who is information, phone directories, and job listings. So if you use the who is database that is just a, a database of information about people who are responsible for websites so let's say that you're going to attack me please don't then you could look up the who is information for flatbox.com and you would see that i am responsible for that you now have some information about your intended victims public web services other things you can do are look for corporate phone directories. If the company has got a publicly listed corporate phone directory, then you can go in there. You can find out if the names of people that work for the organization, their phone numbers, maybe their job roles and things like this. This is going to be very useful information if you want to do social engineering, which we're going to come to in a second. Other things that you probably wouldn't have thought about as well is things like job listings. For example, if you advertise a job position and in there you say that you want a, a voice and video engineer and they need to have skills in the Cisco call manager, well, if an attacker sees that, they can now be pretty sure that what you're using for your voice and video system is Cisco call manager. So if they're going to be attacking that, they already know what kind of system you're using so they can look for vulnerabilities specific to that. So with all this, you need to be very careful and be aware of the information that you're making publicly available. For example, that example I just gave you about job listings, that's the kind of thing that most people would never think about at all. But by doing that, you're actually giving out information which is valuable to attackers. So after the attacker has done this very high level reconnaissance, which is not going to register with any security tools at all, they'll then proceed to do further reconnaissance, they'll dig deeper using tools such as the ping sweeps, the port and vulnerability scanners. Okay, so I mentioned social engineering a second ago. Social engineering is the use of deception to manipulate individuals into divulging confidential or personal information. And it typically involves nothing more technical than the use of a telephone or email. And the attacker will often pretend to be somebody else to trick the victim. So an example of social engineering. Let's say that during the reconnaissance, the attacker did find that your organization has got a public phone directory. And then from that, they find out the name of the IT manager. And if you're a large organization, they know not everybody is going to know the IT manager personally. So maybe they phone up somebody inside the organization. Again, they know who this person is. They've got their phone number and their job role. They phone them up and they pretend to be the IT manager. And then they try to trick this person into changing their password to a particular password or something like that or maybe giving out information about the company which again is going to be more valuable information for the attacker and they can escalate from there a very popular fairly recently and common type of social engineering is phishing this is an attack where the attacker pretends to be from a reputable company to get individuals to review personal information such as passwords and credit card numbers and the victim is often directed to enter their details in the attacker's website which looks like the reputable company's legitimate website 
the attacker has now got their username and password. So if you've got an email address, I'm sure you do, then I'm sure you're used to seeing these phishing attacks. So you're used to seeing emails from Apple or somebody like that. So you get an email supposedly from Apple, which says that there is an issue with your Apple account and it's going to be locked out. Or maybe it says it's from PayPal and it says your PayPal account is about to be locked out. And then there will be a link. You click on the link. It takes you to a website that looks just like Apple or PayPal's website. And it tries to trick you to put your username and password in there. So if, for example, you put your PayPal details in there, the attacker has now got access to your PayPal account and they can take any money out of there. Next thing to talk about is data exfiltration. This is where data leaves an organization without or authorization. So this could be by a hacker who has compromised the system. For example, if it was an attack by the hacker and they've got in there, in fact, this has happened several times in recent years where an attacker has managed to compromise the systems of a financial institution, which have got a database of credit card details. So if the hacker is able to get this information, they can now steal the credit card details of all of that organization's customers. They can then use this to try to do fraud with those credit card details. Or another thing that they could do is they could blackmail that organization, telling them, pay me a ransom, or I'm going to let everybody know that I was able to steal all of your customers' credit card details. It could also be by accident or maliciously by an internal staff member. For example, a staff member sends an email which includes secret information. They could do that just by accident because they don't know any better or they could do it maliciously. Another thing that could happen is a staff member could accidentally leave a USB stick on a bus which has got company sensitive information on there which is not encrypted. Next thing is DOS, denial of service. This is an attack which prevents legitimate users from accessing an IT resource. And it's typically a brute force style of attack which floods the target system with more traffic than it can handle. So the target system gets more traffic than it can handle, can't take any more, and then that just crashes the target system or at least stops it from accepting any more incoming connections. DOS attacks from a single source can be easily stopped by blocking traffic from that single source. So an example of a denial of service attack, well-known one, is the TCP SYN flood. Before I get to that on the next slide, let me explain the normal mechanism that it takes advantage of. So the way that TCP works normally when everything is well is a user. So you can see a user here they connect to a server. When they do that, their PC sends a SYN message to the server. The server will then send a SYN act back. So the SYN stands for synchronize. The server then sends a synchronized acknowledgement back, and then the originating system then sends an acknowledgement. That then completes the TCP three-way handshake, and a normal communication can occur after that. But with TCP traffic, it always starts with that three-way handshake to set up the TCP connection. A TCP SYN flood attack is a denial of service attack, which uses this mechanism to attack the target server. So here you can see we've got the attacker. They send in the SYN to initiate the connection. The server then sends a SYN act back. What would normally happen at that point is the source system here would then send another acknowledgement to complete the three-way handshake. But with a TCP SYN flood attack, what the attacker does is they just don't complete the connection by sending in that acknowledgement. So it's a half open connection. You've got the SYN from the attacker and then the SYN act back from the server, and then they don't send the, the act to complete it. And the attacker will not just open up one half open connection, they will open up so many half open connections that it exhausts the resources on the target system and then it's not able to accept any new incoming connections. So by doing this, the attacker brings down that system. They stop any other legitimate users from being able to open up a connection to that system. 
Okay, so as you saw earlier, if it's a single attacker that's doing that from a single IP address, it's very easy to stop the attack by just dropping all traffic coming in from that one source IP address. But there is a more damaging form of the attack, which is DDoS, distributed denial of service. With a distributed denial of service attack, it's the same type of attack, but it comes from multiple sources, not just a single source IP address. To do this, the attacker builds and controls a botnet army of infected zombie hosts, which they can control. And the botnet is built through malware such as worms and Trojan horses. So with that example about the Trojan horse I gave you before, let's say that you're a gaming fan, you go into a website, it promises to give you the passwords for all of the latest games. So you download that, you execute it, it then installs the attacker's software onto your PC. Your PC has now become a zombie PC and it's possible for the attacker to control your PC and launch denial of service attacks from there. When the attacker gets a big enough botnet, a big enough army of zombie PCs, they can launch very damaging distributed denial of service attacks from there. With the botnet, the infected hosts connect out to the attacker's command and control server. This circumvents firewalls because the connection is initiated from the inside. So if that PC is inside a firewall, then even if the attacker gets the software on there, if the attacker was going to initiate the connection to the zombie PC, it wouldn't work because that would normally be blocked by the firewall. However, firewalls allow traffic from inside the network to go out of the network and then the return traffic to come back in. So what happens is you go and you download a Trojan horse, you inadvertently install the software on your PC, your PC then connects out to the attacker's command and control server, your firewall allows that traffic because it's going outbound, and then the attacker can now send traffic back into you through the firewall, the firewall will allow it because it's return of traffic, and they can now control your PC and they can launch denial of service attacks from there. Distributed denial of service attacks are obviously more difficult to mitigate against because the attack comes from multiple sources which could normally be expected to send legitimate traffic. So with a, a plain DOS attack that's coming from a single source, you can easily see that it's attacking you and you can block traffic from that source. But if traffic is coming from a huge botnet of thousands of zombie PCs, it can be hard to protect against that. There are techniques you can use though, which we'll cover later on in this section. Next kind of attack that we have is spoofing. And spoofing is where an attacker fakes their identity. Spoofing types include IP address spoofing, where the attacker spoofs their source IP address, pretending to be somebody else. MAC address spoofing, for example, ARP, attacks which were covered earlier in the switch security section and application spoofing for example a rogue dhcp server so the attacker can put in a rogue dhcp server in your organization it's not the legitimate dhcp server but the attacker is pretending like it is next reflection and amplification attacks a reflection attack is a denial of service attack where the attacker spoofs the victim's source address. The attacker sends traffic supposedly from the victim, which elicits a response from reflectors. So for example, if the intended victim has the IP address 10.10.10.10, .10 .10 .10, the attacker sends traffic saying that it is 10.10.10.10. .10 .10. So it says that that is its source address. It then sends that traffic in some destination hosts which will send traffic back to the victim and if it does enough of this then all that return traffic going back to the victim can bring the victim down amplification causes a large amount of response traffic to the victim which causes that denial of service effect in man in the middle attacks the attacker inserts themselves into the communication path between legitimate hosts so when the attacker is able to do this man in the middle attack, the traffic, the actual packets that are going between two legitimate hosts are passing through the attacker 
and it can then read and optionally modify the data in those packets. ARP spoofing is a well-known man in the middle attack. We covered that back in the switch security section. Password attacks. If an attacker has connectivity to a login window, so if they can get to that login window, then they can attempt to gain access to the system behind it. Enumeration techniques attempt to discover usernames. So most modern software will guard against this. If you've got old out of date software on there, then it's possible that the attacker can use a tool which will be able to find out the usernames that are legitimate on that system. And password cracking techniques attempt to learn user passwords. The different types of methods that are available to the attacker to crack passwords include just normal guessing. They can also use brute force and dictionary attacks. So with guessing, a study was done fairly recently and it found out that a huge amount of people use common passwords. For example, password using an at instead of an a or the password of let me in and things like that. People use them thinking, oh, this is a secure password, but actually they're used all over the place. Those are the first ones that attackers will guess. If the system does not have an easily guessed password on there, then the attacker can use tools which can do brute force and dictionary attacks. With a dictionary attack, the tool goes through all the words in the dictionary to see if that is being used as a password. And with a brute force attack, that is taking it on a level which will take a bit longer for the attacker. Rather than just using dictionary words, it will use combinations of words. It will also do things like using the at symbol instead of an A, etc. Things like that in an attempt to crack the password. Buffer overflow attacks send malformed and or too much data to the target system. So this is, again, where old, out-of-date software is more likely to be vulnerable to this. If the software does not guard against malformed data coming in, then the attacker can do that, and then they can do that either as a denial-of-service attack, where it crashes the target system, or worst case, sometimes it can actually compromise the system and give the attacker admin rights on that system. And finally, we have packet sniffers. If an attacker has compromised the target system or they've inserted themselves into the network path and they're able to see packets going to or from that system, then packet sniffers, such as Wireshark, can be used to read the sent and received packets. And any unencrypted sensitive information that is in there can then be learned by the attacker. They can use this to damage the organization, for example, by blackmailing them with the sensitive information they have, or if it includes security information, they can use that to escalate their attack and get access to more sensitive systems. Okay, so that was the main types of attacks that hackers will use against you. As we go through the rest of this section, we'll talk about the solutions that are available to you to protect against them. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to get the complete course ad-free right now, then you can click on the link above my head or in the description to enroll in my CCNA Gold Bootcamp. It also includes full study notes, quizzes, and 150 pages of additional troubleshooting labs you can't find anywhere else.